Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. It gives me great pleasure to welcome you all to our AGJC event. As a group purely designed to support Jewish life in the Gulf, the AGJC has achieved great strides in providing rabbinical services, kosher food, providing prayer facilities, providing prayer books, and making it possible for visitors to practically enjoy the freedom of religion in the Arabian Gulf. The UAE and Bahrain being at the forefront of these great strides has sent a wave of optimism to the whole region, that there is a realistic benefit for the return of Jewish life in the region. I am heartened at the wonderful reception I have experienced since the start of the weekly synagogue services in Manama. Many Muslims, Christians, and those of other faiths have come to pray in our house of prayer, and their support has been tremendous, reminding me of how in the 1930s and 40s was described to be a, man a manama of different faith, but one heart. This is what I truly believe lies in waiting for the region. I should now like to introduce two uh, uh, presenters, Rabbi Dr. Eli Abadi, who joined the Jewish Council of the Emirates in 2020 as its senior and resident rabbi. He became the rabbi of the Association of Gulf Jewish Communities upon its creation in February 2021. He oversees the Arabian Kosher Certification Agency and serves as the Av Beth Dean. Also, I would like to introduce Lu'ay Ahmed Al Sharif, based in Abu Dhabi and holds a master's degree in software engineering from Penn State. Lu'ay is active on YouTube since 2012, producing and presenting many entertainment shows. Lu'ay is interested in modern languages, particularly English and ancient Semitic languages, and also in the Arabic, Hebrew, and Syriatic, Syriac traditions and the ancient history. Lu'ai aims to use his knowledge in Judeo-Arabic heritage to build better relations between Arabs and the Jewish people for a better future for us all. Thank you very much, Rabbi Abadi. Thank you, thank you, Ibrahim. Thank you very much, uh, Your Excellencies, uh, Rabbi Rosen, Lu'ai, uh, Huda, everyone, our dear participant, Masa al khair Hag uh, Lag Baomer Sameah and uh, Ramadan Karim. Uh, to explain the celebration of Lag Baomer or Lag Laomer, uh, it's uh, not an easy task because uh, there are a lot of um, uh, celebrations around this day for many reasons during many periods of times in our past history. Uh, suffice to say that um, as the period of the Omer, the historical period, not the counting itself, uh, was a time of mourning because of the passing of 24,000 uh, students, pupils of uh, Rabbi Akiva, one of the most famous uh, uh, sages uh, uh, almost 2,000 years ago, uh, of the, practically the second century. Uh, when uh, we are told that uh, amongst differences of opinion, amongst sages and amongst pupils, uh, unfortunately at times uh, there is a lack of respect for each other's opinion, uh, there is a, like, a lack of sharing of those opinions, and there is a lack of support, of tolerance of each other's opinion. And unfortunately we are told that 24,000 of those pupils perished uh, could be during a period of 33 days or a period of several years, but happening exactly during these days that we count the Omer. In addition, uh, uh, during this, this period, the battles uh, of the revolt uh, against the Romans as they had conquered the Holy Land, they oppressed uh, the Jewish nation, they destroyed the temple in Jerusalem, and a uh, small minute uh, remnants of the Jewish people were left in, uh, in the land of Israel. And as they were seeking for their freedom, freedom of religion, freedom of expression, 
freedom of sovereignty as a Jewish nation, uh, they mounted their revolt uh, against uh, the Romans. And unfortunately, that revolt was squashed completely and a further exile took place and massacres of those Jews that were left there. And so given those uh, uh, sad historical events in the past, why do we celebrate Lag Laomer or Lag Baomer? And our sages tell us first, because that plague or that pandemic stopped. And ironically, uh, in our time, as we see that hopefully that this pandemic is stopping throughout the world, even though we see some countries that that pandemic is increasing more and more, and our prayers go uh, to all of those uh, countries and all of those people suffering from it. But uh, given that that pandemic had stopped then, uh, 1800 years ago, uh, it was a cause of celebration. And another uh, uh, reason also that in this day, the mystical book of the Zohar, of the Kabbalah, uh, was revealed to the nation, was another reason for a happy occasion. And also it was a day in which uh, we are told that Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai, who was the author of the Zohar, as it is attributed to him, uh, passed away during this day, and certainly that would not be a, a day of celebration after passing of another yet sage of the Jewish people. Yet he specifically instructed that to him was a happy occasion because his soul will reunite with its creator. I think the lesson that we learn from those historical events and the subsequent celebrations in which up until today, we celebrate and also up until today, we do mourn as the previous 33 days were a semi-morning days in the Jewish calendar. And the lesson uh, humbly I can say is that uh, life has its ups and its downs. Life has its lessons for all of us to learn. Lessons of tolerance, lessons of respecting each other's opinions, lessons of uh, sharing uh, each other's uh, achievements uh, and uh, lessons of embracing each other and each other's differences. On the other hand also is uh, another lesson of understanding that at the end of the day, we are all children of one creator and our souls were all created by the same supreme being, Allah, God, Hashem. And uh, from the difficult times to happier times, from uh, negative uh, situations, we learn to turn to positive situations. And I think the lesson, as I began saying, is that, that we always ought to make the best out of a bad situation and learn from those bad situations, learn from our mistakes and forge ahead for a better and a brighter future. By first and foremost, accepting each other's differences, by tolerating each other opinions, by respecting them, and at the same time, by recognizing that we are all children of one God, one supreme being. When we know that we are all children of one God, of one father, we are all members of the same family. And that is certainly a cause to celebrate. And as tonight we are gathered to first celebrate uh, Lag Baomer and also Iftar and the month of Ramadan, that is a, a clear, uh, a clear um, situation in which we are respecting each other, we're embracing each other, traditions and customs, and we're celebrating those traditions and customs together. And that is, I think, um, the most uh, uh, relevant piece of, uh, of Lagla Omer of our days. Our hopes and prayers that indeed this pandemic should end, that uh, the world sees a brighter future, that uh, success, health, happiness reign throughout uh, this region and the entire world. And uh, let us pray that indeed that would be the case. Please uh, say together with me, Amen. And in this way, we could uh, continue our celebration this evening. Thank you very much. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. B'shem ha'el ha'Rahman ha'Rahum. In the name of Allah, the most merciful, the most compassionate. Your Excellency, Yusuf Al-Utaybah, Ambassador of the United Arab Emirates to the United States of America, 
Your Excellency Sheikh Abdullah bin Rashid Al Khalifa, Ambassador of the Kingdom of Bahrain to the United States of America. Your Excellency Houdin Nunu, former Ambassador of Bahrain to the United States of America. Your Excellency Mark Sievers, former Ambassador of the USA to Oman. Rabbi David Rosen, International Director of Interreligious Affairs, American Jewish Community, and Distinguished Guests. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah wa barakatuh. Peace be with you and the blessings of Allah and His mercy. Greetings from the land of peace and tolerance, Abu Dhabi, the capital of the United Arab Emirates. Nowadays, we live memorable days with two joys. The first joy is the holy month of Ramadan, which Allah referred to in the Noble Quran and said, Shahr Ramadan alladhi unzil fihi al-Quran, hudan lil nasi wa bayyinatin min al-huda wa al-furqan, faman shahida minkum al-shahra fal yasum. In translation, Ramadan is the month in which we send down the Quran as a guide to mankind and clear signs for guidance and judgment. So every one of you who is present during that month should spend in fasting. The second joy is our gathering tonight, Jews and Muslims united again. The children of our great father, Abraham. We live in days close to what Isaiah ben Amos, the prophet described when he said, nation, shall not lift up sword against nation. They shall learn war no more. I'm so sure that Abraham Avinu is looking down to us, happy that his descendants are working on commonalities to build their societies rather than fighting each other, hating each other, or even killing each other. How great is peace? Peace that was made by courageous leaders like Sheikh Mohammed bin Zayed, and King Hamad of Bahrain and the great leaders of the United States of America and the state of Israel in what is now known as Abraham Accords. Speaking of commonalities, allow me to talk about the importance of a shared value in this holy month between us Muslims and our cousins, the Jewish people, which is fasting. Fasting is an obligation commanded by God for the children of Israel in the Torah. Jews fast several days a year. The most famous fasting is Yom Kippur. We fast to bless the Almighty for all the blessings he had given us, bestowed upon us, provided us, and to behave ourselves and urge our soul to help the needy. The Quran and the Torah agreed on the same principle. Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. Fasting also has the value of belonging, belonging to the group of believers that is also witnessed in the children of Israel, in the history of the children of Israel. The Jews have this belonging when they fast in grief for the fall of Jerusalem and also to rejoice the survival from the plot of Haman, the vizier of Achishvarosh, who conspired to annihilate the Jews from, per from Persia, but he failed. Haman didn't know that God told Bil'am bin Ba'ur when he wanted to curse Moses and the Israelis, do not curse the people for they are blessed. Prophet Muhammad والسلام, was very generous, but during the month of Ramadan, he was the most generous. We try to follow his footsteps in helping the needy and spending part of our wealth to help the insolvent. Commonalities between the Jews and Muslims in Ramadan and overall are numerous. If we only make a consensus on 10% of what we have in common, we could overcome all challenges we have to have a brighter future for our societies. I am so happy to see my dear Jewish friends here in the UAE, in the UAE, the United Arab Emirates, or in Hebrew, Ikhud Ha'emiriyot Ha'araviyot, practicing freedom of worship, work, and investment among their Muslim brothers. Indeed, the days of Isaiah are alive, and we hope the role model set by UAE becomes a model to all Muslim countries in embracing the culture of coexistence with different religions. What we have in common is much bigger than our differences, and we are capable to build our societies and achieve peace and prosperity, and prosperity for all. I do hope that this friendship between us grows stronger and stronger. And unlike 
Rabbi Eli Abadi, when he asks you all to say Amen, I would like to ask you to say for this prayer, as King David said in Psalm 41, Amen, the Amen, Amin, wa Amin, Amin, fa Amin, Amin, thumma Amin. Thank you, Elohim Barakotchem. God bless you all. Uh, thank you, Rabbi Abadi, and thank you, Loai. It's very exciting to scroll through social media and see photos and videos from hundreds of interfaith iftar meals taking place globally. Someone recently asked me if I remember my first iftar experience. As I thought about it, I realized that I could not pinpoint my first iftar because growing up as a Bahraini Jew, iftar and Ramadan more broadly has always been part of my life. This is what led me to host the first ever interfaith iftar at a GCC country's embassy when I was in Washington in 2009. As a member of the Bahraini Jewish community, we are blessed to live in an Arab country, which continues to provide equal opportunities to us as it does to citizens and residents of all religious backgrounds. Over the years, many have asked me what it's like being appointed as the first Jewish ambassador from an Arab country. The truth is that non-Bahrainis are more surprised by my appointment than Bahrainis, because His Majesty has always supported equal rights and opportunities for people of all faiths. It does not stick out as odd to me that a Jew would be appointed to this position. It was an honor to represent Bahrain in my role as ambassador. It is my honor to introduce tonight's distinguished panelists and moderator, all of who I'm proud to call my friends. His Excellency, Ambassador Sheikh Abdullah bin Rashid Al Khalifa, is the ambassador of the Kingdom of Bahrain to the United States. His tenure at the Bahrain Embassy in Washington has been marked by a plethora of accomplishments across a variety of sectors. Among his biggest successes thus far are his involvement in the Peace to Prosperity Workshop, the Abraham Accords, and working with the US government to recognize in its 2020 Trafficking in Persons report that Bahrain fully meets the standards for the elimination of trafficking, making it the first country in the region to receive tier one status. Sheikh Abdullah served as a member of the Bahrain Olympic Committee from 2008 and as its treasurer until 2017. In 2016, his Majesty King Hamad bin Isa Al Khalifa granted Sheikh Abdullah an honorary distinction award, recognizing his gubernatorial achievements and contributions. Ambassador Al Khalifa received the 2019 Stevie Award for the Personality of the Year category for his role in the founding and development of the, Ma of the Ma'an Together program against violence and addiction. I had the honor of giving Ambassador Al Khalifa a tour of our recently renovated synagogue last week. Um, in, in Bahrain, when he was actually on holiday. Um, ambassador Yusuf al Otaiba is the ambassador of the United Arab Emirates, the United States, and Minister of State. His tenure at the UAE Embassy in Washington, D.C., has been marked by several bilateral accomplishments in the fields of security, civil nuclear energy, health, education, culture, equal human rights, and more. Among his biggest successes thus far include his involvement in the US UAE 123 Agreement and the Abraham Accords Normalization Pact. Ambassador Oteba is a current leadership council member of the Center for Public Leadership at Harvard's Kennedy School of Government and helped introduce the Emirates Leadership Initiative in 2014. In addition, he serves on the board of directors for the Special Olympics, where he's worked hard to develop new opportunities for athletes with intellectual disabilities including the 2019 World Games in Abu Dhabi. He also serves on the Board of Trustees for the American University in Cairo and has been closely affiliated with the Meridian International Center, Children's National Medical Center, and the UAE Embassy's Community Soccer Program. Ambassador Lutheb and I first met in 2008 when we presented our credentials to President Bush on the same day. Ambassador Mark Sivers is the former U.S. Ambassador to the Sultanate of Oman, during his tenure, he significantly advanced us omani relations during a turbulent period characterized by war in neighboring Yemen, sharp shifts in US policy towards Iran, and friction among Oman's Gulf neighbors. The US Arab Bilateral Chamber of Commerce declared him goodwill ambassador for 2019 due to his promotion of American business. In January 2020, he joined the Atlantic Council as a non-resident senior fellow in the Council's Middle East programs. Ambassador Sivers has served with distinction in several of the Near East region's most complex and challenging posts. 
including Deputy Chief of Mission and Chargé d'Affaires in Cairo, Political Minister Councillor in Baghdad, Councillor for Political Affairs in Tel Aviv, Deputy Chief of Mission in Algiers, Political Councillor in Riyadh, Deputy Political Councillor in Ankara, and Political Officer in Rabat in Cairo. I actually had the pleasure of meeting uh, um, Ambassador Mark Severus for the first time in Bahrain when he joined my family with, with his family for Passover. Uh, chief Rabbi David Rosen is the former Chief Rabbi of Ireland and is currently the International Director of Interreligious, International Interreligious Affairs at the American Jewish Committee. Rabbi Rosen is the President of the World Conference on Religion and Peace, Honorary President of the International Council of Christians and Jews, and serves as a Jewish Board Member of the King Abdullah bin Abdul Aziz International Center for Interreligious and Intercultural Dialogue, Kaiseed. Rabbi Rosen is on the executive board of directors of World Council of Religious Leaders, a member of the Elijah Institute's Board of World Le Religious Leaders, and past chair of the International Jewish Committee for Interreligious Consultations, which represents world Jewry in its relations with other world religious bodies. For his contributions to interfaith understanding, Rabbi Rosen received a papal knighthood in 2005, and Queen Elizabeth made him a commander of the British Empire in 2010. My link with Rabbi Rosen is that I went to Carmel College, which is the boarding school that his late father, Rabbi Koppel Rosen, founded in 1948. Uh, Rabbi, uh, Rabbi Rosen, over to you. Thank you so much, Huda and Ibrahim, and I, uh, your excellencies, Rabbi Abadi and Rodayal Sharif. Uh, Salamu alaikum wa rahmatullah wa barakatuh wa karim wa ramadan karim. Shalom alaikum wa kulam. Recent years have seen impressive interfaith outreach from the Arabian Gulf. Perhaps particularly notable was the gathering convened by the late King Abdullah bin Abdul Aziz in Mecca in 2005, where he gathered Muslim scholars from around the world to support his initiative to promote interreligious dialogue for the betterment of humanity. And this, of course, led to the establishment of Kaisi, the King Abdullah International Center, which Huda has referred to in her kind introduction. Also notable was the appointment uh, under King Salman of the former Minister of Justice, Dr. Muhammad Al Karim Al Issa, as a Secretary General of the Muslim World League who has exemplified a remarkable outreach to the Jewish community worldwide. And many of you will know that January a year ago, we of the American Jewish Committee were privileged to take him and a leadership delegation of Muslim uh, scholars to Auschwitz on the occasion of the 75th anniversary of its liberation. This was a very moving and great in some ways, uh, while there have been other initiatives within the Gulf, in some ways, however, it is the UAE that has stripped far ahead in its remarkable initiatives over recent years, um, particularly the establishment of the Forum for the Promotion of Peace in Muslim Lands, which has now become a global outreach to the world under the auspices of the Ministry of Foreign Affairs of the UAE, there, of course, is a Ministry of Tolerance that was established in 2016. And in 2018, the Interfaith Alliance from within the Ministry of Interior. Um, these are remarkable initiatives that show a impressive outreach in the field of interfaith relations. So I would like to ask you, Your Excellency Ambassador Aloy Otaiba, first, um, how do you see these initiatives in both combating radicalization and extremism and in promoting a better world? Thank you, Rabbi Rosen. Um, I think this debate and these initiatives are arguably the most important thing the region is going through right now. I think for a very long time, we were not paying close enough attention to religious theologies, ideologies in our part of the world. And we took the way we grew up, we took our values for granted. And then enter a phase of extremist, of extremism, both in Islam and in other religions, and also in political ideologies. And those of us who grew up in moderate 
religious households, tolerant religious households, where we interacted with different, with different faiths every day of our life. I grew up in Egypt, and it was very normal for me to interact with Coptics, Christian Egyptians, or Muslim Egyptians. There were also a lot of foreigners in Egypt at the time. So we grew up taking that for granted. But we've lived through a period where there was Al-Qaeda and ISIS and other extremists and terrorist groups that have taken these values and the religion that we grew up with and, and really perverted it and put it into a very dangerous territory. So we feel, at least in the UAE, we feel obligated to reclaim our religion back from people who basically claim it for either terrorism and extremism on one hand or politics on the other hand. So you've seen us become much more vocal about being moderate. <laughs> Most people who are moderate are never, you know, very vocal about being moderate. It's something that, you know, I think is part of the reason we are here today. But the point is, you know, it shouldn't be a fight. It is a fight. It shouldn't be. If we grew up the way we did, respecting people who practice other religions or even other sects, you know, the, the region would be much more peaceful. Unfortunately, the region has gone through sectarian tensions and religious tensions and political tensions. And what we're trying to say is religion should not be politicized. Religion should not be a form or a wedge issue that divides people. You know, we, we felt very, very proud when Pope Francis came to visit us in February of 2019, because that should be normal. That should be accepted. It should not be a taboo to have a Pope come visit an Arab country and it should not be a taboo to make peace with Israel. These two things are very important to reclaim that narrative back and to show people that while we may have some challenges on politics or with countries, that is not a religious issue. It is not an ideological issue. Those two things should be kept very separate. And that's why I think what we're doing is so important to kind of reclaim that mantle back and show, to, show the entire world that Islam is not inherently violent or it's not inherently extreme. It is a very small group of radicals who take it and pervert it and show a very bad reputation to the rest of us who grew up in a very normal world. Thank you so much. Your Excellency Sheikh Abdullah bin Rashid, um, Bahrain uh, has a heritage of religious diversity and is home to the only indigenous Jewish community in the Gulf and the oldest synagogue and uh, operational Jewish cemetery. Uh, we have heard from Huda uh, how uh, she was uh, privileged to be appointed as the first Jewish ambassador of, bah of the Kingdom of Bahrain to the United States. Uh, we would very much like to hear from you how you see this, what you see the significance of that appointment and perhaps what you see as its message beyond even the borders of ba the Kingdom of Bahrain itself. Well, thank you, Dr. Uh, uh, Rabbi Rosen. Uh, the, uh, the Jewish community in, in Bahrain uh, share a, a common historical background. They trace their roots back to the first Jewish people who arrived on the island in the 1800s. The community mainly came from Iraq and they settled in Bahrain under the reign of the late Emir uh, Sheikh Isa uh, bin Ali al Khalifa. And basically, they were looking for a better quality of life. Um, now, uh, this is this, it's not strange to Bahrain, uh, as a lot of communities and individuals decided to make Bahrain their home back then. Um, they have found people that have welcomed them. And that is what we continue to do to enrich our diversity today. Uh, when it comes to uh, the synagogue, which was established in the 1930s, it's right in the middle of the souk. Um, and Bahrain became the only nation in the Arabian Gulf to house an active synagogue to serve the local Jewish community back then. Uh, I was very privileged to visit the synagogue last week with my friend, Ambassador Nunu. And to me, I think the, uh, uh, it was very special, not because of uh, its size or the lavish furnishings inside of it, but 
the um, the geographic location and the history that that building uh, held was very special. Uh, it portrayed the, the the lives of Jewish Bahrainis. It has served as a place of uh, worship. But now with the recent developments, and we're very thankful for the Huda, uh, for the Nunu family for re recently renovating the uh, synagogue, uh, it will be uh, open for those that are visiting from abroad. Now, um, another interesting fact is a couple of uh, steps away from the synagogue is a recently opened store that sells souvenirs. Um, I bought some uh, Bahrain branded kippahs with me here to DC. Uh, and I think it just shows how uh, a different mindset is setting in, in the region. Um, when it comes to uh, Ambassador Huda's uh, appointment, uh, there were two things that uh, strike me the most. First of all, you look at it from a domestic perspective and you see uh, Huda serving uh, in the upper house of parliament, um, the AJ, AGJC's uh, president, uh, who is here with us today, Ibrahim Nunu, also was a member before her. Um, it just comes to show the importance of representation in Bahrain. Um, and that was a message for local Bahrainis in that um, even in minority communities, representation will always be taken into consideration by uh, His Majesty the King, and uh, opportunities are open and they are equal for all. Uh, from a global perspective though, it has really, uh, at the time, shattered the stereotypical view of women from the region. Uh, Huda was not only the first a female Bahraini ambassador to Washington DC, but she was the first from the region uh, to serve here in Washington. And so uh, I think all of these uh, steps are, are very influential and they continue to be important as we move forward to uh, a, a very different phase, uh, a different set of challenges, but a very different mindset uh, in the region. Thank you. It looks like Saudi Arabia learned from your example. Um, Ambassador Sievers, probably there, there are surely very few persons in the diplomatic world that have the richness of your experience of serving in the Arab world, serving in the Gulf. And I'm sure that the wealth of your own experiences during your tenure has given you some remarkable opportunities of interfaith encounters, and perhaps you would care to share some of these with you and indicate their significance and value. Thank you, Rabbi Rosen, and I'm delighted to be on this panel this evening. I think this is a wonderful initiative by the AGJC, uh, and it's an indication of uh, uh, a very important development, I think, in, in this part of the world. Uh, as Ambassador Oloteba mentioned, uh, this may be uh, really a turning point uh, in the relations uh, among the peoples of this region. Uh, and uh, I certainly hope that that's true. Um, I had a long career in the Middle East as an American diplomat uh, in uh, quite a number of different countries. Uh, my job, of course, was to represent uh, the interests of my country, carry out uh, the instructions of the State Department, support the policies of a whole range of presidents going back to Ronald Reagan, actually, in, in my long career. Uh, but also as a Jewish American, uh, mostly in the Middle East, I, I sought out opportunities to uh, uh, have religious dialogue and to engage people uh, Muslims and Christians, uh, and here in in, uh, in Oman, also Hindus, uh, who are very prominent in the Omani society. Uh, and it's been a very fruitful experience for me uh, uh, personally, and I, I hope that this has, over the years, contributed uh, to some of the spirit of, of mutual understanding that I think is really taking hold today. And I just, as I reflect back on, on some of those experiences, since you asked me, 
uh, there, there were very many, but I can remember uh, uh, hosting Iftar um, in, uh, in my home in, in Rabat, Morocco, um, uh, before that was sort of the, you know, became a, a frequently uh, done thing by uh, American diplomats and attending iftars in, uh, in ambassador's residence, including uh, our ambassador to Israel at the time, Dick Jones, who had a, a, the residence in, in Herzliya, uh, where he invited uh, Israeli Muslims uh, to his residence for, uh, for iftar. Uh, I recall being in Baghdad in uh, 2004 um, under CPA, where our offices were in Saddam's old Republican palace. Uh, and in the palace, there was a large room referred to as the chapel uh, that was used for all sorts of different religious purposes. Um, so we celebrated uh, Passover, Pesach, uh, in the chapel. Uh, with a U.S. Army uh, rabbi chaplain and uh, kosher meals ready to eat. Um, but I, one of the things that struck me uh, about that event is while we were having the Passover service, uh, on the other side of the room, there were a group of Muslims uh, uh, performing their prayers uh, at the same time that we were uh, having our, our Passover service uh, on, the, uh, uh, on the other side of the room. So, uh, that was uh, an important, uh, not just important. I mean, it was a, a moving event, I think, and uh, something very special. Um, representing and advocating for religious freedom and uh, dialogue between religions is uh, uh, a longstanding U.S. policy uh, and something that we have uh, promoted uh, very much in, in the Middle East, uh, particularly over the last 20 years or so since we've uh, established the International Religious Freedom Reporting Requirement. And uh, uh, I remember as ambassador in, in Muscat uh, inviting representatives of the various uh, Christian communities and the Hindus, uh, the Buddhists, I think they couldn't find a religious representative. They sent the Sri Lankan ambassador instead. Um, and there was a Jewish rabbi who, who was passing through and he showed up for, for that event too. And we had a lunch uh, that was really, really interesting and, uh, uh, and uh, a great opportunity. Uh, but also as ambassador, my wife and I hosted uh, at iftars every year in, in Ramadan. Uh, and we had quite a collection of uh, uh, different Muslim ambassadors uh, and representatives of the Omani government and civil society. Uh, at our in the business community at our residence uh, for these events. So, uh, the last thing I would comment is, uh, as residents of uh, Muscat, um, while ambassador, I had the privilege to attend uh, several uh, Jewish holidays at the villa in Dubai uh, when the villa was uh, still just a villa, uh, and I'm very excited to. Uh, look forward to the opening of the new synagogue that, that's coming. Uh, but uh, it, it was fascinating to us to, to see uh, what a diverse community uh, people came from literally all over the region uh, to attend uh, these events, along with the Jews of uh, resident in, in Dubai and how it was uh really welcomed by uh, the Dubai authorities and the Emirati government. So I give great credit to uh, uh, the government, uh, to uh, both of Dubai and, and to the government of uh, the United Arab Emirates for their policy in, in that regard. Uh, in Oman, uh, there is a tri uh, also a, a tradition of religious tolerance. I think it's uh, very well established and very much part of the culture. Uh, but there are very few Jews, so the uh, uh, religious tolerance here largely is reflected in tolerance of, of Christian denominations and of the large Hindu community that I mentioned earlier. Thank you so much, and thank you for mentioning your visits to the villa in Dubai. I will presume and take advantage of my position as moderator to add to your story and let our uh, everybody know 
that I was privileged to spend two Sabbaths with the community in, uh, in Dubai on the occasions that I participated in the interfaith conferences of Sheikh Abdullah bin Bear and his Alliance of Virtue. What's really interesting about that is that these events obviously took place in Abu Dhabi, but as there was no functioning Jewish community there, and as the events either concluded on a Friday or started on a Sunday, I needed to be for the Sabbath as an Orthodox Jew. I needed to be uh, in near a Jewish community. And therefore, the government of the, uh, of the UAE, uh, the, U uh, the UAE, the United Arab Emirates, at its own expense, relocated me to Dubai and put me up at a hotel so that I could be near to the Jewish community and participate in Sabbath services. I wonder whether any other uh, part of the world such a thing would have taken place, showing such care and sensitivity for my religious observance. So you give me the opportunity to also uh, express my gratitude to the UAE for, for its largesse. And perhaps that will allow me to return to you, Ambassador al -Akaiba. Uh, you referred to the significance of the name, the Abraham Accords, and perhaps implied that failures to achieve reconciliation in the past had been in part due to a failure to understand the spiritual dimensions of relationships, to focus perhaps only on tangibles and not to understand the intangibles. Um, and you refer to the papal visit, which of course sends out a very powerful message. In the wake of the papal visit, UAE has declared, declared that it was establishing the Abraham family house where there will be three places of worship. And we'd be delighted to hear from you how that is progressing and what the vision is for this particular complex. Thank you. So thank you for bringing that up, Rabbi Rosen. It's, it's really important to point out that not only was this happening, the Pope's visit, which ultimately uh, a side effect or a consequence of was the Abrahamic house, but this was happening before the Abraham Accords. You could argue if the Abraham Accords even if they did not occur, the Abrahamic house was still going on. And the Abrahamic house, as you mentioned, is going to be a church, a mosque, and a synagogue, all side by side, to not only in practice have different faiths practicing side by side, but to show the world that it can be done. And it can be done in an Arab country, and it can be done in 2021. I think the building is probably between uh, a year and a half to two years away from today, from completion. But... You know, when you look at the Abraham Accords and the Abrahamic House, I think they are different layers of trying to send the same message. The Abraham Accords ultimately did what? They normalized a relationship between the state of Israel and the government of the UAE. Two governments that didn't speak to each other all of a sudden are talking to each other and trading with each other and investing with each other. But what really, to me, is more impactful is it's going to normalize a relationship between two societies that for a long time were told, you can't talk to each other. You're not supposed to talk to each other. One argument was political and another argument was religious. And we're trying to show people that you can normalize Muslims and Jews talking to each other. Muslims and Jews can have a, a, a normal conversation about some issues and disagree on political issues at the same time. It happens all over the world. And we've been held back from this understanding for a long time because of politics. What we're saying now is, can we please make sure we put politics in its own lane to be addressed by governments and civil societies and others, but why shouldn't Muslims and Jews get to know each other better and understand each other better and have a mutual respect for each other while differing on political issues? So I think they're both sort of part, two sides of the same coin. One is the spiritual, ideological, and religious, and then you have another layer, which is the state to state. But both of them really kind of complement each other and show the world that you can do both at the same time. You can have a relationship and improve your sense of understanding and respect while disagreeing on some topics. Thank you. And Sheikh Abdullah, uh, Bahrain has very much espoused such a similar approach. And uh, we have heard now also uh, Ambassador Al-Taiba refer to the importance of the interfaith outreach in, in effect, paving the way for diplomatic initiatives. Um, perhaps you might like to comment upon how important they are also to sustain, particularly because Bahrain 
was, of course, the lead country in the United Nations resolution establishing world interfaith harmony. So this is something that the kingdom has appreciated for already a number of years. And perhaps you could indicate how important you see that in cementing and establishing the diplomatic relationships for the future. Well, thank you for the question, uh, Rabbi Rosen. I think that uh, when we look at Bahrain, it, uh, it has, and it continues to be a lead country in any effort uh, that promotes peace uh, and interfaith dialogue and, and also intrafaith dialogue, which is equally important. Uh, since they're fundamental elements to achieving a, a wider regional peace. Um, um, we have always been a country that values peace and the inherent prosperity that comes with the harmony amongst all people, regardless of their faith. So if we look at the concept of peace, peace is one of the pillars that defines our foreign policy today, alongside human rights, and, and sustainable development. And so if we're looking at the, the ultimate goals of a modern society that, that thrives uh, on economic stability, on security, on, on um, uh, much more, these elements could not be achieved if we don't have peace, human rights, and sustainable development within the country. Now, uh, for us, I think Bahrain is very blessed because of the social demographic that we have. Um, there were a number of traits that uh, helped bring communities closer together. Um, the limited geographic footprint of Bahrain, the um, uh, uh, industry of pearling and uh, being merchants on a trade route that was open to people that all created the need for space for people to uh, practice and to worship. And so a lot of the uh, buildings that we see in Bahrain today are very old. They've been preserved. Uh, they're in geographic locations that are very important. Um, and it still is, uh, is important that the government continues uh, to, to, to promote peaceful coexistence throughout the communities. There are a number of measures that uh, His Majesty has personally undertaken to make sure that there is continuity. Uh, I would say that the birth of uh, what's called the Bahrain Declaration uh, back in 2017 here in Los Angeles uh, was, very important, was a very important step towards that. It was followed by the establishment in 2018 of the King Hamad Global Center for Peaceful Coexistence. Uh, you have a message. You want to make sure that the world listens to you and hears you out um, in promoting peace, love, and hope. Uh, and so you had to have a, a center that promotes that and creates the space uh, for scholars and religious leaders uh, mm -hmm. to meet to one another and to get uh, uh, their messages across. And so, uh, I think it's the whole notion of peaceful coexistence is enshrined within uh, the Bahraini DNA, and uh, it will be there for many years to come as well. Thank you so much. Ambassador Sivas, <clears throat> we will give you the last word uh, on our panel. Um, but if you will allow me, I'm going to put you a little bit on the spot because you spoke about how important it is for the, uh, how the U.S. sees the importance of promoting, obviously, tolerance and indeed religious freedom. But uh, does the involvement here within the Abraham Accords perhaps suggest a new opportunities with regards to the interface between the interfaith and the diplomatic? Do you see that there is potential in a closer relationship between these two dimensions, very much in accordance with what our excellencies, the ambassadors, have outlined. Yes, I do think that there uh, is a potential there. And uh, I think, you know, there is uh, a new element uh, in this uh, that's come out of the Abraham Accords, uh, different elements that were already present, I think, uh, 
uh, in religious uh, dialogue and religious tolerance, um, but are uh, more open and more visible and will be at least in, uh, represented in the Abraham uh, House, which I also look forward to, uh, to visiting when it's open and, and completed. Uh, I have, I've been to the, uh, the synagogue in, in Manama, uh, but uh, before its formal reopening, I look forward to uh, the opportunity to seeing it again. Uh, but I think these, uh, you know, it, it's a bit tricky because we have uh, constitutionally a separation of church and state. Um, the U.S. government doesn't advocate for, for any particular religion. And yet uh, basic uh, appreciation for uh, religious freedom and the uh, free expression of, of different religious uh, practices uh, is fundamental to uh, the American system, the American way of life. And it, it's something that I think that American diplomats should feel comfortable uh, advocating for because it represents uh, a, a view that's strongly held by a large part of the American people. And that's what diplomats are supposed to do. And I'll end there. Thank you so much. And, and thanks to... Uh, 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 His Excellency Sheikh Abdullah and to His Excellency Yusuf al Taiba, as well as to yourself, Ambassador Sievers. Uh, it's been a pleasure to be able to moderate this conversation. I wish we had more time, but my responsibility is now to bring this to an end and to hand the gavel back to Ambassador uh, Hodanu. Thank you, Rabbi Rosen, for moderating a very interesting dialogue with the ambassadors on interfaith and coexistence. Ramadan reminds me how lucky I am to be a Jew living in the Gulf, and specifically in Bahrain, where religious freedom is a core value. Since our Jewish community has always been so well embraced, we have become part of the fabric of Bahraini society, and our families have always lived alongside Muslim families. Our grandparents shared stories of their neighbors helping to heat their food on Shabbat. Generations later, we continue to celebrate important events together, including attending each other's weddings, our participation in their iftar meals and their visits to our recently renovated synagogue. Thank you all for joining us this evening as we celebrate both Lagba Omer and iftar together. Both Sefirot HaOmer and Ramadan are a time for reflection. And as Jews and Muslims, we must ref reflect on the catalyst which has propelled our region forward. And that is interfaith diplomacy. It is something that all of our leaders are committed to. And as we embark on this era of creating a new Middle East, one focused on peace and prosperity for all, it must be our guiding light. We must inculcate this with our children so that it guides how they live as adults. To our friends who are joining us from outside the Gulf, you being here means the world to us, and we appreciate your support. Thank you to His Excellency Ambassador Sheikh Abdullah Rashid Al Khalifa, Ambassador Yusuf Al Oteba, Ambassador Mark Sivers, Rabbi Rosen, Rabbi Dr. Eli Abadi, Ibrahim and Lo'ay for their important insights this evening. For those who would like to be updated on AGJC events and resources, please follow us on Twitter at Gulf Jewish or visit our website www.gulfjewish.org and make sure to, to subscribe to our newsletter. Thank you again to everybody and have a good evening or a good morning, good afternoon, wherever you are in the world. Take care. Goodbye.